morning, everyone. Let's just make sure everything's working here. I'm a little bit, oh, there we are. We're showing up on YouTube with just a little bit of a delay. Let me close that. Last time I was talking to myself for half an hour before I realized it wasn't quite working. So, um, so now I like to check to make sure everything's going well before we get started. Hello and welcome to another live stream. We're doing this every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. So thank you for coming to the live stream again. This week we're going to talk about muscles and treating muscular conditions or muscular pain with Chinese medicine. And this is going to be not anything too specific, just more some general philosophy about an approach to treating uh, muscles and orthopedic conditions using traditional Chinese medicine. So if you're here in the chat, go ahead and say hello, let me know where you're from, and let me know, do you treat a lot of ortho things? Is that something you're interested in? Are you interested in sports medicine? Um, is this something you see a lot? Let me turn this off. Is, is this something you see a lot in the clinic? So if you're in the chat here, let me know. If you're uh, watching the replay, let me know in the comments. What kind of conditions do you, do you like to treat in the clinic? Is it more internal things or more orthopedic things? Because that's what we're going to talk about. So usually with these live streams, what I've been doing lately is we spend the first 15, 20 minutes talking about a topic, and then we'll move into a just general Q&A. So if people have questions, you can leave those in the comments. And... Alex is here. Alex is here from San Diego. Hi, Alex. Good morning or afternoon. Oh, from Baton Rouge. Thanks for being here. So let's talk about muscles. Because this is a thing we treat a lot with Chinese medicine. We tend to treat a lot of um, low back pain, sciatica, neck pain, musculoskeletal imbalances, things like that. And so I just want to say a few things about at least my opinion on how to approach some of these things. So let's see. Let's see. First of all, when we're treating muscular uh, orthopedic conditions or musculoskeletal things, I think one important thing to keep in mind and one thing that people forget is you can treat orthopedic conditions with traditional channel theory. And I feel like this is something that people forget about a lot, that it's they spend three years of their school learning uh, traditional Chinese medicine, learning pattern diagnosis, learning about the, the channels, the sinew channels and everything like that. And then they take an ortho class and all of that goes out the window. Suddenly now they're, they just want to needle motor points, needle trigger points. And it's, and it's like this one semester class just kind of took over everything they had learned about Chinese medicine up to that point. So I'll tell a little story, uh, not to be mean or anything, but this is just something that happened when I was supervising in the school clinic is we had a patient come in and the student was presenting the case. The patient had a lot of hip pain, hip pain on one side that was going down the leg. And so she was presenting her case and I said, you know what? It sounds like she's got a lot of pain in the gallbladder channel, though the area she's describing and the way it's radiating down, to me that sounds like a gallbladder thing. So if this were my patient, what I would do is I would think about needling points on the gallbladder channel. Maybe do some local points like GB29 and GB30 to get into the area of the pain. But then since the pain is going down the channel, we can use points like gallbladder 34 and gallbladder 40 or gallbladder 41 just to kind of open up the channel. This is what when Deadman uses this phrase, activates the channel and alleviates pain. Basically, we can use distal points down the channel to kind of clear out the channel or remove obstructions from the channel and help with that pain that's going along the channel. But it just so happened that I was substituting this week and there was another uh, very good practitioner next to me who specialized in sports acupuncture, sports medicine, treats a lot of athletes, uh, does a massage practice where he deals with a lot of orthopedic conditions. So I said, well, this, this is his specialty. This guy, this, this is his specialty. This is what he sees a lot of. Let's ask him, because I think it's good to get varying opinions, to get uh, different viewpoints about how to treat this condition. So since this is his specialty, Let's go talk to him and see what he thinks. 
And so listening to him was, was really fascinating. He's talking about, oh, if, he, if she has pain right here, it could be that these muscles are involved. You can do these muscular, these uh, range of motion tests. You can uh, have, her, have her do external rotation with a hip flex and then have her do external rotation with a hip extended. You can do all these tests. It's, it might be this muscle, it might be this muscle. And he had really good knowledge of Western anatomy and it was really interesting to, to listen to. And then afterwards, like after he went through his whole thing, I said, okay, th th that was really interesting. Based on the results of those tests, what do you think your treatment would look like depending on, on how these tests come up? And he said, well, you know, it, there, there seems like a lot of hip things. I would do some local points like GB29 and GB30, and then maybe go down the channel and do some distal points like GB34 and GB41. So I thought that was kind of funny that we both had two different approaches but we arrived at pretty much the same treatment strategy. So I think that's just something I like to point out sometimes is that even though dry needling has become very popular and even though people like to think in terms of muscles and trigger points, we can still look at things in terms of our channel theory and in terms of Chinese medicine. That if it's a hip thing, if it, you can think about what channels are involved, is it the gallbladder channel, the UB channel? If it's a low back thing, what channels are involved? Is it the UB channel or the DU channel? If somebody has impingement of the ulnar nerve coming down the arm well, with like pain or tingling coming down the arm, it's like you can think of that as the ulnar nerve coming down or you can think of it as a small intestine channel and think about where is that blockage happening in the small intestine channel. So that's just the first point I want to make is that even if we're taking an approach to orthopedic or sports uh, musculoskeletal conditions, we can still use our channel theory, the things we learned in, uh, with traditional Chinese medicine as an approach to treating that. Elizabeth is here. Aloha, Elizabeth. Hope you're someplace warmer than I am. Juliet is from England, uh, starting a five element course. So I'm, I'm assuming that usually when people say five element, they mean J.R. Worsley five element. So um, that's really cool. I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I have a lot of friends who do it. So that's really cool. And I guess maybe that's another interesting story about um, how we can still treat orthopedic conditions using our TCM knowledge is I did have a five element teacher who um, he told this story about when he was in five element school they had a patient come in and the patient came in with back pain and they were treating it from a five element approach and one of the other students in this class was a chiropractor and the chiropractor kept kept saying to the, the instructor and so he's like you know I could do an adjustment and fix this real quick. Like, why don't, why don't we just do that? And the instructors were very much like, no, we can actually treat this. We can treat the CF, we can treat the constitution. And by treating this, that will alleviate the back pain and make sure that it doesn't come back. And so uh, even just doing those five element treatments, treating the CF, treating on the, the channel of the constitution, by balancing out the body, they were able to alleviate this patient's back pain. So that's, that's, we can always still go back to our TCM. So I think that's the, um, the first thing I like to say is that we can still think about it in channels. Once you start treating orthopedic conditions, you don't have to throw everything out the window. And kind of along with making sure we stick to TCM, I think the second important point is when you see an orthopedic condition, make sure that you're still treating the root. Make sure that you're still treating the person's constitution. Make sure you're still thinking about what is causing this condition. Because this is another thing I see happen, that at least when I was dealing with students in the clinic, that a person would come in with shoulder pain, and so the intern didn't ask the 10 questions about their sleep or digestion or anything like that, didn't take the pulse, didn't look at the tongue, just threw, a, just threw a big X through the chart and said ortho treatment, and then they went and did their protocol of rotator cuff muscles or whatever. And I think that even if you want to take a, a trigger point approach or a dry needling approach or a musculoskeletal approach, I think it's still important to keep the TCM and think about treating the root. 
So if a person has sciatica or they have a lot of hip pain, you can think about why did this hip pain present? Is it because they have liver blood deficiency and so the blood is failing to nourish the tendons so that uh, so the tendons become worn out or you get hypertonicity of the tendons because they're not being nourished by liver blood? If that's the case, yeah, go ahead and stick some needles in the area, but make sure you're also treating the root of tonifying liver blood. Or maybe they have liver chi stagnation and that's causing a lot of spasm and contraction. Maybe they have internal wind. And so you still want to treat those root things that might be underlying that orthopedic condition that you're treating. And so this is kind of something that I've heard from other people who do, do a lot of ortho treatments that they've told me that if they just stick to their ortho protocols, the patient will get better, but it will be temporary, the pain will come back, and they'll have to treat them again. However, if they do their ortho protocol and then treat the root, treat the underlying deficiency, or treat the stagnation, or extinguish the wind, once they treat that root, their treatments stick better and last longer. So I guess this could be a thing that you like if you're if you're really into making money, this could be a good thing that you you treat the person, they feel better for a week and then they have to come back next week because they're they're in pain again, they have to come back next week because they're in pain again, and each time you get temporary results. But if you want to have a lasting effect, instead of just needling trigger points and putting them on e stem, also make sure that you're treating the root that's causing it. Veronica's here. Ciao, Veronica. Walter. Aloha, Walter. What's your take on GTO? Uh, let me know what GTO stands for. I'm, I can't think of what that means off the top of my head. So even if you're um, even if you're treating locally, treating the muscles, then make sure you're also treating the root, and that will have your treatment stick better, last longer. Um, okay, uh, Golgi, sorry, let me, uh, Golgi tendon organ. I don't know, sorry, I don't know a whole lot about that. That's not my specialty, so. Um, let me look that up and get back to you about that. So even if you're stabbing people locally, even if you're treating the local condition, think about treating the root, especially in deficiency conditions. Like if you have a 60-year-old or 60, 70-year-old with low back pain, yeah, do a bunch of whole, do a bunch of stuff in the low back. Uh, do Hua Tos, do Ba Liao, do UB40. But think about maybe their low back pain is also due to some kidney yang deficiency. And it could be that until you address that kidney yang deficiency, their back pain isn't going to go away. Maybe you have um, an athlete that works really hard, but they're, they have a lot of liver chi stagnation. And it could be that until you resolve that liver chi stagnation, they're going to keep getting injured. So make sure that you're always uh, treating the root. And kind of connected to all those, kind of connected with um, don't abandon your TCM theory, make sure you're treating the root, is we can take a very yin and yang approach to treating musculoskeletal conditions. Here's what I mean. If you remember back to the very beginning in your first fundamentals class, the first thing we always go over is the theory of yin and yang. Usually it's first yin and yang, then the five phases, and then you get into fluids and anatomy. But the first thing we always go over is yin and yang, this so-called duality of opposites, that everything can be divided into pairs of opposites, and there's a certain way these opposites interact and a certain way we can use this relationship to reestablish harmony. And we always start with a theory of yin and yang because essentially that's everything we're doing with Chinese medicine basically comes down to we're trying to harmonize yin and yang. Whether you're doing acupuncture, herbs, twain ah, cupping, we're trying to harmonize yin and yang. Whether that's heat and cold, dampness and dryness, too much movement or activity like wind, too much um, inactivity being uh, static or inert, like maybe with too much dampness, 
person is too active, they can't fall asleep. person is too inactive, they can't wake up. We're always trying to balance out yin and yang, whether it's through herbs, acupuncture, or other treatment modalities. Well, it turns out we can apply these same principles of yin and yang to musculoskeletal conditions. I mean, in, to some ex extent, like quite literally, it's muscles come in pair in opposing pairs. That for every muscle, you have a muscle that flexes the elbow, and then you have other muscles that extend the elbow. You have muscles that abduct the shoulder, and you have muscles that adduct the shoulders. So these muscles have agonist and antagonist pairs. They're pairs of opposites. So it's yin and yang. Even when we look at the individual muscles, we can still apply this theory of yin and yang, that muscles generally have two states. They can either be tight or they can be relaxed. They can be in a state where they're shortening or they can be in a state where they're lengthening. Taken to their extreme, you can have too much tightness with spasm and contraction, or taken to the other extreme, you can have too much relaxation where you start to get flaccidity of the muscles and they don't work properly. So we can, we can think about muscles in terms of yin and yang, both in terms of their opposing pairs and the movements of the muscles, pushing and pulling, or we can think about as a binary, the state of the muscles, that they're either active and contracted or they're relaxed. What does this mean? Well, I guess what this also means is that we can apply this theory of yin and yang to treatment. That if we have pairs of muscles, maybe we need to think about treating muscles in pairs. So rather, so just like we can use yin to counteract yang, we might have to use muscle pairs as part of our treatment. We can also think about it as we're balancing yin and yang in terms of balancing out the strength or the stretch of the muscle. I feel like this is real confusing. Let me back up here or give an example. It's really common to, that I see a lot of patients come in and they look like this. And they say, oh my, I have all this tightness up here. It's giving me headaches. I have this headache that starts here and runs up my head. I just have a lot of neck and shoulder pain. And so I think it's really common for people to see this and say, oh, the traps are tight. I better do gallbladder 21 to release the traps. And I better give them stretching exercise to release the traps. And I better um, do, do cupping and e use liniments to relax these muscles. But what I'm saying is because of the yin and yang nature of this, usually what happens, what I find is that because muscles work in pairs, Yes, the traps might be too tight, but there's also some other opposing muscle that's too weak. And so this is, so as a treatment strategy, maybe we shouldn't just relax the traps. Maybe we should also think about strengthening the opposing muscles. So this would mean not only do I want to relax these muscles, I want to strengthen the muscles that bring the shoulder blades back and down. And once I do that, the head naturally comes back into place and it puts a lot less tension on these muscles that are trying to hold up the head. So we're doing a dual strategy of, on the one hand, it's, it's a yin thing of relaxing these muscles, but on the other hand, we're doing a yang thing with some opposing pairs to get the head back into place. I mean, other examples would be like when you get anterior pelvic tilt and uh, the person's butt is sticking out. They say, oh, my low back is real tight. I have all this pain back here in my low back. And it's like, yeah, we can do, um, we can do hua to points. We can do ba liao to loosen up the low back. But maybe there's some opposing muscles that are too weak. Maybe we need to strengthen the core. Maybe we need to relax the hip flexors. Maybe we need to strengthen the glutes in order to pull everything back into focus. Oh man, I got pit stains going on today. Upvote, upvote this video for pit stains on my shirt. So basically we can take this kind of dual approach of there are certain things that need to be stretched and certain things that need to be strengthened. And usually a lot of people like to default to the stretching and relaxing because that's the tools that we have. We can stick needles in there to re, uh, relax the muscles. We can do tui na to relax the muscles. We can do cupping to release the muscles. But it could be that if you neglect the strengthening part, the condition's just going to come back.
that you can a person will come in like this and every week you're gonna you're gonna release the traps and they're gonna feel good for a couple days but then by the, the next week comes around they're gonna be like this again because they didn't do enough to strengthen the muscles that keep them upright And I do think this is a kind of funny thing that I do see a lot of people like this. And it's kind of funny because that used to be a bro thing that you used to get all these men who they would go to the gym, but they would only want to work out the muscles that they could see in the mirror. So they do a lot of bicep curls, they do a lot of bench press, and they end up and they end up looking like this because they overdeveloped their pec and most likely their, their anterior delt. So I've had that some people come in looking like this and I'm like, oh, my shoulder hurts. And it's like, does it hurt right here? Um, but it's kind of funny that that's kind of switched lately that now I have a lot of female patients coming in with the same thing. And it's basically because they do a lot of yoga. They do especially a lot of Ashtanga Vinyasa yoga where they're doing like 50 chaturangas. And when you do a chaturanga in ashtanga style, it's basically like their chaturangas are basically burpees. And so it's like when you do 50 chaturangas, you're doing 50 burpees or you're doing 50 push-ups. And so they're doing a lot of pushing things that bring the shoulders forward. But in yoga, you can't really do a lot to strengthen the pulling motion of the upper back. So they end up with these overdeveloped pushing muscles and nothing to balance it out. So they look like this. And then they say, oh, I have this headache that starts at the back of my head and goes up the gallbladder channel. So that's another, that's, that's something we can bring into our treatment strategy of muscles have a yin and yang nature. They come in yin and yang pairs and they have a yin and yang state. And so usually if you have something that's too tight, there's some sort of opposing pair that's too weak. So our treatment strategy should address both sides. It should address the thing that's too tight but then we also need to strengthen the thing that's too weak, and that can usually result in better, uh, better permanent outcomes. We also need to think in opposing pairs. So sometimes you get a person coming in with, with low back pain or with sciatica, and it's like, yeah, you can, you can do hua toes, you can do baliao, you can do UB23, you can do things in the hip like GB30, uh, huan zhong. You can do all these points to treat the back, but you might also have to come to the front and treat the hip flexors. And so you need to think about the yin and yang of the situation and treat both sides. Oh, good. Veronica is saying, no worries. We can't see your pits. So I totally just brought attention to it when you can't even see it. This was a problem I had when I was recording that herb course is I did a, I did a course for single herbs. Um, and I did it in my loft where it was like, it was like 90 degrees in this upstairs loft and I was trying to record this. So if you have the, the single herbs uh, review video, there are times when it's like, I'm just like sweating profusely. I have huge pit stains. It looks terrible. I'm gonna re-record some of those some days. Do I have a contrast button? I have a gamma button. Does that make it easier to see? Anyway, enough about my pits, my sweaty pits. Mallory's going to make fun of me because she knows I'm self-conscious about my sweaty armpits. So this is just a general my opinion. When, we, when we're looking at orthopedic complaints, when we're looking at sports injuries, when you're looking at musculoskeletal things, I think it's important to take into account the yin and yang nature of these that you might one, we can think about, as we said, we can think about the muscles in opposing pairs. So just because one muscle is tight, you might have to think about what is, what is the opposing pair doing and address both of those. It also means if something is too tight, you might have to strengthen something else. On the other hand, if something is um, uh, too weak, too flaccid, it could be that something else is tight. It could be that you have to loosen something else, loosen up something else in order to relieve the pressure. So... Um, let me get back to that. So we can kind of take that dual approach. And I guess part of the reason this all started is, um, lately I've started becoming a bro again. Like I've been spending like two hours in the gym every day. I don't recommend that. Don't do that. 
Um, my pantry has like five different types of protein powder on the top shelf. Don't do that. I don't recommend that. But I've started becoming a bro again. And so there's this, there's this other guy on YouTube I like to watch, uh, follow, called, his name is Jeff Nippard. And he just came out with a video about posture and does posture actually contribute to pain and what kind of things can we do, um, what kind of exercises actually work. And so he did a really good interview with a posture expert, Dr. Spinelli. And so I put a link to his video in the comments. And also he did a podcast. I think the podcast is actually more informative. And so that kind of inspired this, let's talk about muscles. Because one of the things they commented on this is that does posture actually contribute to pain and doing daily exercise, does that actually help? And I guess what I'll say is in my clinical experience, I've had a lot of people come in with stuff like this where they say, I have neck pain, I have this headache that comes up the back of my head. And when I start asking them questions, a lot of times they will admit that they think that their posture is a contributing factor to the condition that's going on. Here's the thing. I've had a lot of patients say that they try to mentally or consciously fix their posture. They'll say, oh yeah, I keep reminding myself to sit up more straight. I keep reminding myself to do that. I'm putting a lot more focus on having good posture. I've never actually seen that fix pain. That just, just focusing on having better posture. I've never actually seen that, that work with these people. What I have seen is I've seen people say, oh yeah, I started doing heavy deadlifts and now my back pain went away because I have a stronger core. I started doing deadlifts and now people ask me like, are you taller? Have you grown? It's like, no, I just, I strengthen the muscles that help keep me upright. Or I've had a lot of people that they say they start doing rows, they start doing pendule rows or heavy barbell rows. And by strengthening the muscles in their upper back, that relieved their neck pain. And so that's, that's what I kind of mean about the stretching and strengthening of muscles is that a lot of people will focus on, oh, I need to stretch, I need to have good posture, when really what I've seen and kind of what some, some of the evidence shows is that just strengthening the muscles that keep your body upright, that's what's going to have a more positive effect. And so kind of there are some studies that say that people who engage in resistance training have fewer aches and pains just because they have an increased capacity to work. They have an increased capacity to hold their body up. And so that's kind of what brought this all on. It's going to go somewhere else with that, but I forgot about it. So that kind of brings us to the fourth one uh, that I think is that strength training can be a form of yang sheng. That is, when we say yang sheng, we mean nourishing your life. And so usually we think about this as like preventative exercises or preventative medicine. But I think, at least in the classics, when we talk about yang sheng, we're usually talking about things like diet, that you should eat a diet that has all five colors and all five flavors. You should balance your diet with the seasons. So you should eat warming things in the winter and cooling things in the summer. It talks about... Uh, the the Neijing talks about how you should align your activities with the seasons. So in winter, it's okay to go to bed early and uh, wake up late. Whereas in summer, you should be more active. In spring, you should let your hair down and stride briskly through the through the courtyard. And so we should also align our actions with the seasons. Usually when it, with Yangsheng, when we talk about exercise, we're talking more about doing qigong, doing tai chi, and those kinds of things to nourish our life and prevent disease. So I guess my argument at this point is, as we said, people who engage in strength training tend to have fewer aches and pains. So now, bear in mind, I'm a little biased because I'm a bro and I really like powerlifting. But in my opinion, I think in the modern times, our yang sheng should also include some sort of strength training or some sort of resistance training. Um, that it could be that 1500 years ago in the time of Zhang Zhongjing, people didn't need to do that. People were, were physically active enough that they didn't have to intentionally 
do strength training exercises or resistance exercises or exercises to balance out their musculature. But I think today this is something that we see a lot just with the, the lifestyle that people have, that a lot of people come in with these conditions. And usually if it's, if it's a chronic condition, it's often that they just their, their body isn't strong enough to hold itself upright or hold itself in a natural position. So by doing strengthening exercise, that can help. When people come in with more acute conditions, say I have a patient that he went out and gardened for five hours and he's not used to doing it and now he has all this back pain and his sciatica flared up because he was working in the garden. Basically it's he didn't have the capacity to do that work. Whereas if he had, if he had been engaging in regular s strengthening exercises, then he could have gone out and done that work and his body would have been resilient that he would have had the work capacity to do those things. That if you engage in regular strength training, you'll, your body will have the capacity to organize things on the bottom shelf for half an hour at a time or, or things like that. Um, so yeah, this could be something that here Elizabeth is saying uh, Pilates, reformer Pilates. I think that means you use the, the machine with the pulleys. So yeah, something like that. I'm just biased. I like barbells, so I like, to, I like to pick up heavy things, but I know that not everybody's into that. So doing something in there to help strengthen, um, that, can, that can be very good as preventative medicine as well. And again, I think this is like a lot of people, they, they go to yoga, they think about preventative medicine in terms of stretching, and so they stretch out things really well, and they think that's a thing, but sometimes you also need to think about strengthening the things that hold your body in place. So strengthening the rhomboids um, and the muscles of the upper back in order to keep your head in place, that strengthening the erector spinae in the low back so that you can handle those loads, things like that. And so, and so I guess maybe I'll say something really briefly about like acute versus chronic things because I feel like that's a very good approach to take to um, if people have chronic things, usually there's something that's too weak and we need to strengthen it. And so you can support them with acupuncture for pain relieving techniques, but I think in order to get those uh, things to stick, you might have to give them some sort of strengthening exercises so that they can hold themselves up in place. Sometimes acute things are a little bit different like um, like I have a, a jujitsu uh, person come in that they, they threw out their low back and then sometimes it's like their, their pain is an 8 out of 10. We do some acupuncture and cupping. It immediately brings their pain back to a 2 out of 10. And so it's we had really good results relaxing, softening these muscles. And that was really good for acute things. I still think doing some strengthening would be good that it could prevent those things from happening. And this is, this is something that Jeff Nipper had mentioned in his podcast that he said it used to be that every once in a while when he would sleep in a weird bed or in a hotel or something, he would get a kink in his neck. He'd wake up with like some sort of spasm. But once he started doing direct neck training and strengthening the muscles in his neck, it never happened again. So that's another way we can think of either strengthening as uh, to help with chronic conditions or we can think of it as preventative to uh, prevent some of those other aches and pains that pop up. So that's all I have to say about that. How long have we been at this? Oh man, I rambled on for like half an hour. Awesome. So if you have any questions, if you want to do, uh, we can do some Q&A if you just have random questions, not necessarily related to that. And if you have a question, just help me out in the chat. If you put like four question marks before it, or if you type question in capital letters, that'll help me see it easier. I think that's the chat's not too crowded, so it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, before that, just, just a couple announcements. Um, number one, like I said, I started becoming a bro again, and I've been spending a lot of time at the gym. Sometimes I'll go to the gym for like two hours at a time, and that is not something I recommend. But something I started doing is one, while I'm in the gym, uh, I'm not really into listening to music, so I started listening to podcasts. So one podcast you can listen to is the, the acupuncture podcast, podcast.tcmstudy.net. 
Um, so that's one thing you can do is if you're if you like to work out, if you're going for a walk, if you have long commutes in the car, check out the podcast. Self promo there. Another thing you can do, or another thing I've been doing, is sometimes listening to podcasts is hard, but you can also listen to audiobooks. And so uh, it turns out we do have a couple, there aren't a lot, but there are a couple TCM books that have an audiobook version. And so uh, one of them I found is, let me see, yeah, The, the Spark in the Machine by uh, Daniel Kuhn. And so this, this is kind of an interesting book. There's an audiobook version. And basically, um, so basically what I did is it turns out Audible has like a free trial. And so if you like sign up for a free trial of Audible, they give you two free audiobooks. And even if you cancel your free trial, you still get to keep the book. And it turns out there are only like two books on Chinese medicine in Audible, and this is one of them. So this is just, uh, if you do want to listen to something, if you're getting bored uh, reading textbooks, this is just another option that you can go to Audible, sign up for their free trial. You can get the, you can basically get this audiobook for free, then cancel your subscription, and you still get to keep the book. So I put a link to that in the, um, in the description there too about how to do that. And uh, full disclosure, that's a um, that's an Amazon affiliate link. So if you sign up through that link, that gives me like a five dollar commission when you sign up for a free trial. So that's just a way if you want to help out the channel, that's the way you could do it. Speaking of helping out the channel, one more plug that we'll do. Um, I've started playing around with something with the Patreon um, by making a, a community. Uh, like a community membership website. And basically this is a, a website that it's kind of like a private Facebook group, except it's not on Facebook. So it's not like Facebook is giving you ads and it's not like Facebook is stealing your data. Basically I'm paying money for this community to exist. And so that means we get to do whatever we want with it. So does this work? So, th so this is just um, what it looks like is, it looks very Facebooky similar, but people can go on and post things. Some people uh, posted some questions, and I did some uh, video responses to their questions. So kind of the idea here is this would just be a place that if you're studying and you want to ask some questions, you can pop on here and ask them, and we can answer them or have discussions about things like that. So that's just something that's available to the Patreon members. So if you... If you're a member of the Patreon, if you're a member already, then I should have sent you an invite to that. And if you want to sign up for the Patreon, I put a link for that in the description below. So um, right now, if you just sign up for the lowest tier, I'll, I'll invite you to that. And you can just another way to keep in touch with people. Uh, OK. If a person's muscles, let me click on it. If a person's muscles are still weak and untoned despite regular exercise and good protein intake, would that mean a weakness of the liver? Mm, possibly. So this gets into an interesting question that a lot of people will ask. Um, I was going to make a video, a, a Q and A video about this. Is sometimes we talk about sinews, and sometimes we talk about flesh. And sometimes we say muscles, and nobody knows what we mean when we say muscles. So, um, so when we talk about the liver and the tendons, the Chinese term is jin. And so we usually uh, either, in the old way, we translate that as tendon and muscles, like the tendinomuscular meridians. The Nigel Weissman translation is sinews. We talk about the sinew channels and the sinews. And by sinews, we mean like tendons and ligaments, at least in Western medicine. And then we also talk about the spleen and the flesh. Flesh means, uh, the Chinese word is ro. It literally means like meat. Like if you have twice cooked pork, it's hui guo ro. Twice cooked or return, return to walk flesh. So when we say the flesh, we're talking about the meat. The problem is, sometimes we use the word muscle. And sometimes when people say muscle, they mean the gene. And sometimes when people say muscle, they mean the ro, the flesh. So like, which one are we talking about? And this is not an entirely correct thing to say, 
but this is the way I think about it. How do we differentiate between the liver and the tendons and the spleen and the flesh? Well, if we're talking about tightness, contraction, uh, inability to move, inability to bend and flex the joints, then we're usually talking about the liver. Maybe there's some liver chi stagnation. Maybe there's not enough liver blood nourishing the tendons, so we get hypertonicity of the tendons. Maybe um, there's wind uh, going on causing uh, twitching and spasm. But whenever we talk about spasm, contraction, tightness, inability to move the joints, we're usually talking about the liver and the sinews. Anytime we're talking about weakness or flaccidity or things wasting away or not having enough strength, we're usually talking about the spleen and the flesh. So um, sometimes I think about like people when, they, when they're on cancer treatments or chemo that their muscles start to waste away. Then we have like a whey or atrophy syndrome. Then I would think about the spleen and the flesh. If we think about heaviness of the limbs or inability to lift the limbs, we're talking about the spleen and the flesh. I don't know what your question was. What was your question? If a person's muscles are still weak and untoned despite regular exercise, weakness of the liver, possibly I might be more inclined to go to the spleen. When I talk when we say like weakness, flaccidity, or atrophy, sometimes I'm more likely to go to the spleen, but it might depend on the person. And it could be that maybe they're they're getting sufficient protein intake. Also, this is another thing. I'm a bro. I think my definition of sufficient protein intake is wildly different from other people's definition of sufficient protein intake. So um, I'm one of those one gram per pound of body weight kind of guys, but uh, I know that normal people freak out about that. So yeah, fle uh, flesh on the spleen, is that's, that might be where I go. It's because it sounds like you're... Um, uh, when you say weak and untoned, it's almost like you're talking about an atrophy syndrome. And so it might be different if this happened like post-stroke when people have like weak, knit, like weak grip strength and things like that. Post-stroke, then that might be a little bit different. But if we're ta just talking about general atrophy, I might look into, uh, in Chinese that's called Wei syndrome. So I might look up, uh, in some of your books, look up atrophy syndrome and see what kind of things they say. Um... Golgi ten yeah, I don't even know if it's Golgi or Golgi, so I'll have to look into that. So um boop boop ba doop boop boop Hi from the UK. Gua sha within treatments. Um yeah, so basically what I found about gua sha, like, like some of these other modalities, I kind of feel like what people do is if people like certain things, they're more likely, it's like if people like something done on them, they're more likely to do it on others. And that's just kind of a thing I've noticed. Like some people, when they went through school, they really liked getting ear seeds. So now they do ear seeds on all their patients. And that's just a thing they enjoy. It works well for them. It works well for them patients. Some people are really, they got cupping done on them and they really liked it. So now they do cupping on all their patients. They're really into it. I've had other people that it's, they got gua sha done on them. And now they're super into gua sha and they do gua sha on all their patients and they get really good results with it. So I, th so I think some, to some extent, oh, same thing with moxa. I hate moxa. Uh, like, I don't like doing moxa. I never really felt much when I got moxa done on me. But other people, it's like, oh, I got moxa, and it was amazing, and now they do moxa on all their patients. Um, so I think it's one of those things where, to some extent, it comes down to practitioner preference. I think all those things are good. I tend to do a lot of twin ah on people just because I have a background in massage, so that works really well for me. I, I do a reasonable amount of cupping just because I enjoy getting cupping. I enjoy doing cupping. I enjoy playing with fire, so I do a lot of cupping. I don't do quite as much gua sha, but I know other people that do a lot of gua sha and get a lot of good results. Um, this is also one of those things where I feel like at some point in time, we, we learn some differences between cupping and gua sha that maybe cupping was a little bit better for cold, whereas gua sha was a little bit better for releasing heat. So maybe if you have an exterior attack, you could you could do one or the other based on whether it's cold or heat. Or if you have things in the muscles, it could be that um, cupping is better at drying out cold, whereas gua sha is better at releasing heat. 
Um, I've had some people say that gua sha is better for chronic conditions. So say like you got in a, in a car accident, you got whiplash and you had this neck pain, but it's been lingering for months and years afterwards, then doing gua sha can help that out. Some people say that gua sha is especially good because you're um, breaking up adhesions. Whereas with cupping, it's more like we're drawing uh, blood into the area, whereas gua sha, we're mechanically breaking up heat adhesion. So it's especially good if you do it cross fiber. So a lot of people take a lot of different approach approaches to that. So um, it's one of those things where I, I normally do more cupping just because I think more people are familiar with it. People are less freaked out about it. And um, but some but I have had patients come in and, requ and request gua sha. Um, and I don't know if I always do this way, but I feel like I've had Chinese people tell me that Chinese teachers tell me that if you're going to do something like that, you usually do acupuncture first and then your physical manipulation. So they usually do acupuncture first and then do tween ah, do acupuncture first and then cupping afterwards or do acupuncture and then gua sha afterwards. I feel like I usually do it that way. Except with tween I tend to do a lot of tween first and then some more tween afterwards. Uh, protein powders are cold for the system. I haven't heard of that. I haven't heard of that. Let me make sure I'm looking right. I haven't heard of that. I haven't really experienced that. Um, I think one thing to look at is sometimes the quality because a lot of like our best protein powders are dairy based. So if you don't like dairy, then that rules out a lot of protein powders. Like soy protein powder is kind of junk. Whey protein and casein protein are the best in terms of their amino acid profile. Um, you can get rice protein. If you're going to do a vegan protein, do a blend of rice protein and pea protein because that will give you an amino acid profile that's similar to whey protein. Um, so I think maybe some of it comes from, I guess I could see that sometimes people have problem with the dairy aspect of it. And there are ways around that. Basically, if you get, there's like whey concentrate and whey isolate. And so if you get a whey isolate, that's basically their, that's filtered really well that there's no lactose or anything in there at all. It's just protein. Whereas if you get like a cheaper whey concentrate, there might be some trace lactose in there. And so that could be giving you problems. So it, it could be creating that dampness because it's dairy. Um, and I think that's, uh, some of that's very individualized. There's some people who that they like start taking protein powder and they get really bad acne. They get, um, they get really bad diarrhea and sometimes even like really bad gas. Um, and I think it just depends on your digestive system that some people can handle it and some people can't. Personally, I've never, it's like we always say in Chinese medicine, you should avoid dairy because it's better for your spleen. I've never really had a problem with dairy. And so I think it might be that certain, certain ancestries genetically can handle dairy better. So I would guess it has something to do with that. Um, so I guess it has to do more to do with the dairy aspect than the cold aspect, but I don't know. I'm just talking out my ass here, so. Do you recommend TCM for bipolar disorder? Um, so this is one we have to be careful because I'm not giving out personalized recommendations. Uh, I don't want to answer personal questions. Um, but in terms of uh, bipolar, I think uh, our, our TCM term for that is Dian Quang, or we sometimes translate it as like mania depression. And so we do have certain formulas for that. We do have certain treatment protocols for that. That is a disease that's recognized classically in TCM. And so that's something you can look into. I would say with anything, it depends on the severity and whether or not you want to do it as an adjunctive treatment. And so this is something that I guess maybe this is something that there are different grades of, of bipolar and depending on how severe it is or what other kind of um, things are going on, it could be that um, we have to take a dual approach of, of Western and traditional. It could be that acupuncture and herbs are supporting uh, 
what's going on with their, with their Western meds. Sometimes it's the case that the medications they're on, we can't do herbs, that there's, there's too much of a, a worry about interaction between the herbs. So it kind of depends on the situation, I think. But, but I mean, just as a general answer that, yes, we have um, classically there is a disease similar to, similar to bipolar that we call Dian Kuang, mania depression, and we do have certain, we, there are ways to treat that. Um, in terms of efficacy, I think that's a very individualized thing. Interesting talks on the podcast. Oh, yeah, that last one, we got, oh, we drank way too much bourbon. Um, I actually threw up uh, after after that one. Um, I feel like I've only thrown up from alcohol uh, a couple times in my life, and it's always involved Patrick Gitley, except for that one time. But the other times, it always involved Patrick Gitley, so I always blame him for my alcohol consumption. So I'm glad that podcast was at least coherent because that took a long time to edit all that, edit out all the incoherent parts. So anyway, podcast, podcast. Thanks for watching the pod or thanks for listening to the podcast. Um, I'll have to see if I can, I can find some more people. I'm, I'm, I've been contacting a few people, but a lot of people are busy. So I'm not sure if I'm either going if I'm going to have uh, something to come out this week. We might have to take another week off. Let me see any other questions in the chat. We're starting to get to the hour, so maybe we can wrap it up. But let's see if there's any other questions here. Usually, the liver overacts, where the spleen becomes weak. Yeah, and yeah. So talking about the Ku cycle, and this is this is kind of an interesting thing. I know this isn't really a question, but this gives me something to uh, uh, talk about. This is kind of an interesting thing that we have this relationship between the the liver and the spleen, and sometimes it's an interesting thing of we get liver overacting on spleen, but it's hard. It can be hard to tell who to blame. Sometimes it's the liver is angry, and so then it attacks the spleen. Sometimes the spleen is weak. So the liver, being the jerk that it is, uh, takes advantage of that and overtakes the spleen. So I think that's, that's kind of like we always have to keep that in mind when we're dealing with one or the other. So an example of this would be in the Nanjing, it says, um, it gives this quote, the superior practitioner treats what is not yet ill, while the mediocre practitioner treats what is ill already. And so th this is kind of a throwback to the Neijing, because in the Neijing, when it says this, the, the superior practitioner treats what is not yet ill, it's talking about preventative medicine. It's talking about don't wait until you're thirsty to begin digging a well. Treating what is already ill is like waiting until the, um, the enemy is upon you to begin forging weapons. It's like trying to quell an uprising after it's already begun. So when we talk about the Neijing, about the superior practitioner treats what is not yet ill, it, te it seems to be talking about preventative medicine and doing things to prevent disease. When we get to the Nanjing, it kind of takes a different perspective. When it says the, the superior practitioner treats what is not yet ill, it's talking about a disease that exists, but the progression of the disease. So it actually gives the example when it says the superior practitioner treats what, what is not yet ill. What does this mean? It is like this. Suppose there's evil chi in the liver. Well, the superior practitioner knows that when there's evil in the liver, it tends to transmit it to the spleen. So the superior practitioner will fill the spleen so that it's unable to accept the evil from the liver. And that's what we mean by treating what is not yet ill. When, the, when you say the mediocre practitioner treats what is ill already, the mediocre practitioner would just look at the liver and only treat the liver. So that's kind of an interesting thing about our preventative medicine also means looking at the course of disease, that we know that the liver tends to overact on the spleen, so we build up the spleen in a preventative way. And this is kind of illustrated in the formula Xiaoyao-san, that um, Xiaoyao-san has a, a Duiyao pair, Chai Hu and Bai Xiao, to kind of soften, relax, and course the liver. But then we also have Baiju and Fu Ling there to reinforce the spleen so that the, so that the liver can't over, overact. So if you're taking a test, 
If you're taking a board exam and they ask you about Shaoyao-san, technically Shaoyao-san, you have to see liver qi stagnation plus spleen qi deficiency plus blood deficiency, and that's when we use Shaoyao-san. Clinically, it could be that even if you only see liver qi stagnation, you could still use Shaoyao-san because you're using the strategy of filling the spleen so that the liver can't overact. You're tonifying the spleen preventatively, and that would still be an appropriate use of Xiaoyao-san. Um, that was kind of a weird rant about liver overacting on spleen, but I just like to pull that out sometimes. Um, do you plan on any doing foundations videos? Uh, eventually. So this is this has been kind of an issue where um, like everybody wants me to do everything. So so I have a lot of people being like, when are you going to make a you uh, when are you going to make a bladder video? When are you going to make more herb videos? When are you going to make formula videos? When are you going to make a formula course? When are you going to do stuff on foundations? Are you going to do stuff on diagnosis? And it's like I can't make four years of material all at once. Like I, I appreciate your enthusiasm. I was like I can't make four years of material all at once. Um, so eventually I would like to, it could be that I'll wait until the beginning of next semester, but it's, it's just kind of been this thing where I have to prioritize, um, should I finish all 12 channels first? Um, I started doing a lot of herb stuff and then kind of stopped halfway. Should I finish doing my single herb stuff? Should I be doing more formula stuff? Um, should I make Q and A videos with weird things about inverted menses and fear versus fright? Or should I do fundamental things? And so I, I kind of have to prioritize about which one, which ones of those I want to do. And, um, but basically kind of to fill in that gap, I guess I can say this too. I had a lot of people asking me about um, tutoring. And my initial response was, I don't really like tutoring. Um, especially individual tutoring. I've just, like sometimes I've had really good experiences where I just explain things to people and it clicks. Other times I've had bad experiences where people get really needy and they don't do they don't want to do the work and kind of use the analogy of like sometimes you get a, you hire a personal trainer. There are some people who they want to hire a personal trainer to do the exercise for them, and it, you get to a point where it's like, listen, I can tell you what to do, I can give you a plan, I can't work out for you though. And so sometimes you get in the same thing with tutoring. It's like I can try to explain things, I can't study for you. At some point, you have to open your book and read your notes. Another long rant. Anyway, people have been asking me about tutoring. I also didn't want to do tutoring because I was like, if I'm going to do one-on-one -on -one tutoring, I'm going to charge you $80 an hour because that's what I charge for acupuncture. If I'm going to not do acupuncture and do tutoring instead, I'm going to charge you a similar rate. And I kind of feel like nobody wants to pay $80 an hour for tutoring. I guess if you do, send me an email. Um, so kind of what I said along was trying to do some group tutoring where um, do you like a subscription model for that? Anyway, the long-winded answer to this is I started doing a couple things with fundamentals as part of this group tutoring thing. And so let me see if I can bring this up. Uh, basically, I made a subscription thing on Teachable. If I have to spell my name right, it helps. Um, So I started doing a, trying to do a group tutoring thing on Teachable. And so here it is. And so the first couple sessions is we did do something on yin and yang. We did something on the five phases. And then we did something on point categories. Oh, that's an hour and 20 minutes on point categories. Um, so I did start doing this. And this is basically it's the what I'm testing out is doing $30 a month. And then we do one tutoring session once per week. Right now, it's a small group. And they're all um, they're all they're all first semester students. So that kind of keeps it, uh, uh, it keeps it kind of easy that we can keep our topics there. And so um, that might be an option that if, if you're interested in joining on that. And so basically we're, we're doing weekly tutoring group tutoring sessions. We record the sessions and then archive it on that teachable thing. So you'd have access to all the previous stuff plus weekly live sessions. That's either we talk about a topic or 
people ask questions. I'm just trying it out. I haven't really figured out what we're actually doing yet, but um, I sent out an email about that. If you want to get in on that, send me an email. We can talk about what you want. Uh, fear versus fright. Uh, this is something I was thinking because I was also thinking about making like a, a Q and A series because those videos I could do short two or three minute videos answering basic questions about that. Um, and that was one of the things that tends to come up. So uh, here's maybe the rough draft version of fear versus fright. So fear versus fright, just to give some context, this, this is something that usually comes up when we talk about diagnosis. So when you're in, a, in your fundamentals class, you talk about um, like yin bing, the causes of disease. And generally in TCM, we divide our causes into three categories. There are external causes, like the six evils, wind, uh, heat, cold, dampness, dryness, wind, summer, heat. Those are the external causes. There are internal causes of disease, this would be the seven affects. And there are miscellaneous or non-internal, non-external causes of disease. So that would be things like diet. And that, and that people get confused on that. Diet is actually considered a non-internal, non-external cause of disease. And I've gotten questions on tests about that. So just remember, remember that one. Anyway, when we talk about the causes of disease, one of the causes of disease is internal causes. We say the seven affects or the seven emotions. And so we have these seven emotions. Each one is associated with an organ. Uh, so we say joy is associated with the heart. Um, anger is associated with the liver. Uh, grief is associated with the lung, so on. Then we also say things about how these emotions affect the chi dynamic. So we can say that like joy causes the, uh, the chi to slow down. So sometimes I think about this when, when you have those old cartoons when like two people fall in love, it like the it starts going in slow motion where they're like do 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 and they're like running towards each other in slow motion. So that would be joy causes a chi to slow down. Anyway, when we start talking about the seven emotions, usually at the bottom we get to fear and fright. Kong and I get the word I forget the Chinese word for the other one. We talk about fear and fright. So everybody always asks, what's the difference between fear and fright? Um, now I don't have a source for this, but I've heard some people say that uh, fear is more chronic, like a long-term feeling where fright is more acute, like you get startled. I've heard some people say that fear more is more often occurs in adults, where fright more often occurs in children. And again, that's just something I've heard. I haven't actually seen this in a textbook, so I don't I don't really have a source for that. But I think I know where they're coming from with that. But anyway, when people ask me what's the difference between fear and fright, my honest answer is I don't know and I don't care. Here's what I mean. Let's say that a person is experiencing an emotion of being scared. Well, let's look at how, how is that manifesting physically. Say they get real scared, what happens? Their heart starts pounding. They can feel their heart pounding in their chest. Maybe they start to get sweaty. Their palms get sweaty. Mom's spaghetti. And maybe they lose the ability to speak coherently. Either they're, they just, they're dumbstruck, they lost their voice and they can't speak at all. Or maybe they're, they start babbling incoherently and they're just saying nonsense. And you kind of have to shake them a little bit or slap them to, to snap them out of it. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is the emotion is affecting the heart and causing shun disturbance. So if you start getting palpitations, that means the heart is affected. You start sweating, sweat is the fluid of the heart. You're, you're unable to talk, the heart sprouts in the tongue and is responsible for the voice. Um, sometimes people are, they lose the ability to interact intelligently with their external environment. They're just, they're just freaking out, they're in a panic attack and you have to shake them. That would be an example of shun disturbance, that the heart shun is being disturbed. So when we look at those symptoms, we can see pretty clearly that the emotion is affecting the heart. 
let's take a completely different scenario. Let's say somebody has an experience of being scared and it causes them to wet their pants. They, they, they lose control of their bladder. Well here, well, here we can see that bladder is controlled by the kidney. We say the kidney governs the, uh, the lower yin orifices. We mean the urethra and the anus. And so if someone gets so scared that they lose control of their bladder or they lose control of their bowels, like so scared I shit myself, that's a pretty good indication that the emotion is causing the chi to descend and that emotion is affecting the kidneys because the kidneys govern the yin orifices. And so rather than think about what does fear look like, what does fright look like, we can really just think about how is it affecting the, the body physically. If the emotion is affecting the, the heart, then we can say uh, that's the, the heart emotion. If the emotion is affecting the kidney, we can say that's the kidney emotion. Here's where it gets even more complicated. When we talk about the seven emotions, we usually talk about fear and fright related to the heart and the kidney. There's also a statement of fact in Chinese medicine that the liver governs fright. And so I think this is that what we're talking about. Usually when we talk about the liver and gallbladder with fright, that's when we're talking about being startled. And sometimes we use this, there's a disease name called childhood fright wind. And I think that's why people, people would tell me that fright is more likely to affect, the ch affect children because we have this disease called childhood fright wind. And so how is that different? Well, again, we can just start looking at how is it manifesting in the body. If you have an experience of being scared and your muscles contract and you get tight, well, the, again, we said the liver governs the sinew. So if you get scared and you, you feel your, your muscles get tight, we know that the emotion is affecting the liver. Childhood fright wind is an extreme condition where like the person will go into convulsions, like a, it's like febrile convulsions, that uh, a condition of being scared can cause um, spasm and convulsion in children. So again, this is wind, which is governed by the liver. So here we have um, the emotion is connected to the liver. And so sometimes we think about kidney, sometimes we think about heart, sometimes we think about gall liver gallbladder. So for example, if a person has nightmares and they wake up at night feeling startled, we might say, oh, that's gallbladder chi deficiency or a disharmony between the heart, the heart and the gallbladder. And we have um, herbs for that. So it's kind of like with those emotions. In, in fundamentals class, we'll talk about the heart and the kidney, but then later we'll also talk about liver gallbladder. So all of those organs uh, have to do with fear and fright or timidity, lack of courage, um, but I think really the way to, instead of trying to differentiate, differentiate them based on the characteristics of the emotion, it's better to differentiate them based on how are they affecting the body. And then we should also recognize that a lot of them interact. Like when we talk about running piglet chi, that's the, the chi going from the kidney up into the heart, giving you a panic attack. So there it's both the kidney and the heart. Or when you talk about uh, waking up at night startled, that's an interaction between the heart and the gallbladder. So sometimes we have multiple organs at once, so I think it's easier to diagnose them that way. I don't know if any of that made sense. I want to make a video about that, but put some diagrams in there. And it's also kind of funny that if you get your uh, Practical Dictionary of Chinese Medicine by Nigel Weissman, if you go into the entry on fear causes the chi to descend, he'll, that's, he'll mention that. He'll talk about uh, chi descending, the kidney controls the, uh, the lower yin orifices. So if a person loses control of their bladder, that's an example of the chi descending. If a person loses control of bowels, that's an example of chi descending as a result of the motion. But then he also talks about, um, because it's the kidney and the kidney governs essence, the, the, the fear can also cause the chi to descend and cause spermatorrhea. So I think that's kind of funny to be like, it's one thing to be like, oh, I was so scared, I shit my pants. It's kind of another thing to be like, I was so scared, I came in my pants. And I thought that was kind of funny. So we might mention that too. Um, any other questions? I'm starting to get hoarse. I need to go drink some tea. I need to go to the gym. I didn't go to the gym this morning. 
Today we're doing uh, barbell snatches and clean and jerk. So I'm real excited about throwing around some heavy weights in a gym that is not designed for heavy weights. Um, so if anybody anybody else have any questions before we before we go, go uh, drink some drink some protein. Get a mix of whey and casein. Get a mix of both starchy carbohydrates and simple carbohydrates, both glucose and fructose, because they have different metabolic pathways. So it's good to get both of them pre-workout. I'm just rambling here, just waiting to see if anybody has any questions, because I think we're on like a 10 second delay. So if anybody has any questions, let me know. Otherwise, we're going to sign off. And I'll see you next week. If you haven't, oh, I know my buttons don't work there. If you haven't checked out the podcast, look at the podcast, podcast.tcmstudy.net. A lot of people said they really liked the last one just because I was the most drunk in the last one. So if you're bored, check out the podcast. There may or may not be a new one this Tuesday. It kind of depends on if I can get some people scheduled. Uh, but check out the podcast. If you want something else fun to read, um, again, you can go go look at this book. I always do this backwards because it's mirror image. Go look at this book. Um, there's a link in the description below if you want to download this for free from Audible. That you can get this as a free audiobook. Uh, the Spark and Ma the Machine. It's basically he's talking about how we can think about the channels and think about chi in terms of fascia, and he brings embryology into it. So it's it's kind of an interesting, fun book. It's it's not really a study book. You're not gonna and you're it's not gonna help you pass any tests or anything like that. But if you just want to read something or listen to something that's about Chinese medicine, but it's a little bit more fun than reading a textbook, uh, this is a book you can read. So there's a there's a link to that in the description below. Um, and again, that just they throw me a commission when you sign up for that. So that's a way to to help out. Um, Thank you to the Patreon members for your support. Again, we got a um Oh, I don't have enough anymore. Uh we have a special a special website for if you're on the Patreon, you can come here and you can ask more questions and this is just kind of like a private Facebook group. So, if you want to uh sign up for the Patreon, you'll get access to that. I think that's all I have to say about that. We'll be here next week, Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Mountain, 1 p.m. Eastern. I don't know if anyone was in, is in Central Time Zone. Um, if there's nothing else, we'll see you next week. Thanks for being here. So thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. If you have any um, topics that you want to talk about for next week, let me know. Uh, if we didn't get you to your questions or if you're watching on the replay, just leave them in the comments below and we can answer them next time. But um, see you next week.